is an extraordinary story about how she became an activist on the heels of a personal catastrophe. Her journey resulted in a book, a thinly veiled account of how her mother was killed and where that led her, ultimately to how she says humanity is being profoundly altered in ways that we have not consented to. Cara St. Louis, welcome to the show. Hi Richie, hi. Great to have you in. Um, this is horrifying stuff, this. Yeah, it is, and we're used to it. That's the most horrifying thing. I back-checked mm -hmm. every one of these, and there are dozens of them, or dozens, mm -hmm. in January 2014 alone, mm -hmm. and every one of them, believe it or not, was actually given a mention by the mainstream media, Absolutely. but nothing farther. Right, right. That's, that's the thing. We're getting used to this stuff. We think it's uh, normal. We think it's supposed to happen, and it, and it just isn't normal. It isn't supposed to happen. In fact, um, the very first <clears throat> incident that you mentioned, I will, I will get back to that in a, in a moment, um, with the uh, 10,000, 5,000, 6,000, 10,000 blackbirds that fell to the yeah, plummeted yeah. to death. Yeah, what year was that again? 2010, it was, it was yeah. Uh, yeah, it was December 31st, 2010. I remember that for a very good reason. But if I can back it up just a little bit, I always, um, I like to start at the beginning with this story uh, because it's important. And um, uh, that was a few months prior to the blackbirds falling from the sky, uh, July 10th. What were you doing then? I was a mom. I was just uh, living my life, an ordinary life, sewing costumes for my children who were in school. And I, frankly, I think that's as important as a job as anything else. Sure and um, just living and uh, taking care of my teenagers in a little uh, seacoast town in Maine. Yeah. And um, that was a Saturday. And then the very next day was July 11th, 2010. It was a beautiful Sunday morning. Yeah. Very small town, not a lot of traffic, lots of tourists, beautiful seashore. Uh, my mother, who was 74 years old at the, at the time, was on her way to church, which was about a block away from her house, just crossing Main Street and crossing the side, the, the crosswalk that you guys, I think you call them zebra crossings here. Zebra crossings, yes, yeah, and that's the was, right name for them, by the way. Is that the right name? Okay. It is. Thank you for schooling me, <laughs> Richie. Anyway, I get to the, she was just about to the other side to step up uh, on the sidewalk when she was actually run over by a van. Um, and uh, it didn't end well. It was uh, I got a call from the priest that morning. I, I went to the hospital, and uh, you know it was a situation where every bone in her body was broken. It was not good, and she died in my arms a few hours later, which of course is a cataclysmic incident in anybody's life, isn't it? I and for imagine. myself, for my yeah. children, and frankly for the community, it really manhandled the community. Um, so you're a close knit community. A small, everybody close, knew everybody. Small community, yes. Yeah. As a matter of fact, yes. However. The important thing for me after that, after I sort of got over the initial shock, was remembering that my mother had a very high security clearance with the Navy, the U.S. military. It had been her second career, but she'd been doing it for quite some time. She was an editor and writer for the U.S. Navy. She had worked uh, in Virginia in weapons. Uh, she had worked here in London at the Office of Naval Research, which I think is a very important um, piece of the puzzle here. Uh, she she worked with the scientists that put out that were working on things like atmospheric uh, weapons, plasma studies, microwave weapons, psychology, all of the things that you might think uh, you would see in a military think tank. And she edited the uh, the papers for that the scientists would write, and then she would put them together in what's called the Navy fact sheet, which you can find online, by the way. Yeah. Now she, of course, having that clearance, mm -hmm. um, we got to say this. Uh, people might think we're saying the obvious, but sworn to secrecy, of course. Absolutely. She couldn't tell me oh, anything. Oh, yeah, couldn't speak about it. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. She couldn't say much of anything to me about what she did, and she never did. Uh, but when she was in London, one of the things that she did say here in 1991, I remember very specifically she said to me one time, you know, the things I'm seeing scare the holy hell out of me. Forgive me for saying that, but yeah, that's, yeah. that's a quote. Um, and that's really all she could say about it. So she was here for a couple of years working with those scientists, one of whom I did meet and uh, get to know fairly well, and I never mention his name because I really ought not to. Yeah. It's all in the public domain anyway, so anyone who really wanted to scratch around in there could, could find that information. But he was a specialist in atmospheric physics and plasma studies, and so, you know, you, you go through life and you, and you have these things that you sort of park in your consciousness because you, 
because they won't leave you alone, you know? Yeah. And uh, as I went through that fall, I could not get any information about my mother's death, even out of the local police department or the district attorney's office. Yeah, because he wanted to know um, mm. um, who, who hit her. Exactly. Um, is there any follow-up on that? Are right, you investigating right, right. it? Where right. are they? You know, right. Where are there witnesses? What's going on? Yeah. yeah, and I knew there were witnesses, and I knew the sort of the name of the fellow who had hit her, but that's it. I didn't even know when, my, when the fellow was before the grand jury. I was just sort of completely out of the loop. So they did arrest somebody. They did arrest somebody, yeah. and um, you know, I'll tell you about that too soon, but uh, they did arrest somebody, yes, as a matter of fact, and I, but I couldn't get any information out of the local police. In fact, my attorney had to send them a letter reminding me, them that there was such a thing as a Freedom of, of Information Act, and I was the sole survivor. But Richie, think about it. If she's a 74-year-old little, year old, little old lady going across the street who dies in a terrible traffic accident, what's so secret about that? Yeah. That we can't know the details. And as we went through that fall, I will tell you that one day I did get in the mail a hand-addressed envelope with no return uh, address on it, and someone had slipped inside a uh, a police report, it was a minor police report, but it was something. So I could see that someone was trying to get me some information, but was somehow unable to take credit for the, it was not an official envelope by any stretch of the imagination, okay? So as I went through the fall, we got to uh, the incident, a couple of incidents really, and, and a lot of acti activists talk about these two things together, which I find amazing because they do go together. It's like a pair of aces we got dealt so we could deal with this. On December 31st of 2010, there was a fellow in the United States who was killed who was called Jack Wheeler, John Wheeler III. Remember. Yeah. He was responsible, largely responsible for putting together the Vietnam War Memorial. He had been an advisor to three presidents. I mean, this was not an yeah. unknown fellow. And in retirement, he was working with Department of Defense contractors who were trying to get work with the U.S. government. So he was a busy guy and um, from all accounts, very hale and hearty and healthy. And uh, they found him in a dumpster on the December dumpster, 31st, yeah. and as to <clears throat> the best of my knowledge, that really hasn't been investigated even to this day. No, it hasn't been, no. no, they just let that go. The very next day, January 1st, 2011, is the incident that you have already mentioned. Thousands of blackbirds fell from the sky dead all at the same time. Well, that got everybody's attention, didn't it? Because that just doesn't happen. No. We know that just doesn't happen. No, it wasn't just the birds. They were also um, mm -hmm. in a nearby lake. There were thousands and thousands of fish right, right. Um, turning up dead, washing yeah. up on shore and right, stuff right, like right. that at the same time. Yeah. Right, and, and, and that caught everybody's attention. And those two things go together. They certainly went together in my mind because I was already thinking about atmospheric physics, atmospheric weapons, things like that. And, and this feeling that I don't know why my, little, my mother was run over and killed in the street. That's just too random. I can't let go of that. So um, anyway, that really pushed me into starting to write the book. And frankly, I had known all along I was going to have to write about it because that's what I do. I'm a writer. And I thought, well, this is going to have to be written up. But now I've got these incidents. Someone's dead. Someone else is dead. And all of these animals are falling from the sky for no reason. The most preposterous reasons they gave us. Do you remember firecrackers, I think, is what they told us to be. Oh, there with. was a load of them, yeah. But I, I, I told you, I rang Arkansas Fishing Game. And mm -hmm. there a guy, a guy called Stevens, yeah, yeah. Uh, spoke to me on air and he said, um, he was very honest. He said, we haven't a clue, really. Right, right. And I mentioned these possibilities, firecrackers and stuff. And he was like, nah, don't think it's that. He said, we don't know what it is. And that was extraordinary. Right, right. right. I think we've actually... I mean, there's a there's a, a theory that's been floated, I think, that we can talk about as to why that may have happened. But um, <clears throat> Shall we so have a quick I got recap? Should we have a quick recap? Sure. So your mum, who's um, had a very very serious naval clearance, she writes for the navy. She works around. She's been working in Britain. She worked in in, in the US. She's working around guys who are developing new and exotic weapons. Um, she's run over in the street. It's not investigated properly. You can't get any information out of the police. Mm -hmm. And around about this time, these strange things start happening. Mm -hmm. um, birds start falling out of the sky. Uh, Wheeler uh, turns up dead in a dumpster. And of course, the following day, we have all of this. Yeah. And you're starting to wonder, there might be a connection here. Yes, absolutely. I, and that's when I sort of open the laptop and start to type things in. And that included um, writing down what I already knew about that had happened so far and doing some investigating. And all you really have to do, Richie, is type in atmospheric weapons. And it's like... Pandora's box springs open, and all kinds of the most ugly things come flying out at you. Um, you were open-minded now, Cara. I am. Well, no, no, you were at the time. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm sure. not saying you're not now. Sure. But at the time, you went into that thinking, I don't know what I'm going to find. I'm just going to have a look, basically. Yeah, honestly, Richie, I have to tell you, I hoped I'd... You know what I wanted to find? I wanted to find that my mother had randomly been run over in the street. Of course I did, right? 
But that's not what I found. I found you know, incident after incident after incident that let me know that maybe, yeah, I'm writing about my mom, but maybe what I'm writing about is something else altogether. And in fact, that's the way it turned out to be. Now, I also have to mention that during this period of time when I was writing the book, uh, there's a rainbow of coincidences that I'm going to paint for you, Rich. Um, a couple weeks after my mother died, I was driving her car around, and, I, and uh, a sedan pulled up beside me, yeah? and pushed me into oncoming traffic. Okay, that was the first thing, no and I thought, wow, that was a coincidence two weeks after my mother was run over, huh? And okay. then um, as I went through, like I said, I couldn't get any um, information on her death. And then uh, it wasn't too long after I started writing the book that my steering went out in my car. And luckily, oh, while well, I was driving, but luckily I was in a, a spot where, you know, hitting the brakes didn't kill me all by itself, you know what I mean? But you know, how many times in your life does your theory just steering well, just go me. out? I mean, it doesn't happen to people, right? Yeah. So these were the Did kinds of. Did you report of... these things? Then? No. Because no. you know, I would have said, you know, if, you know, if I was your friend, I would have said, Carrie, you got to report that to the police. You know, somebody's trying to knock you into oncoming traffic. Um, your steering is going out. Why didn't you report it to the police? Well, first of all, these were the police that I couldn't get any information out of to begin with. Okay, and I had a. You know, here I was walking this tightrope between not wanting to find out what I found out and, and finding out what I found out. And these things were happening to me, and it wasn't very clear to me how that was going to turn out for me either. And so for me, it felt like the safest thing to do was hold this sort of watchful waiting kind of, you know, what, it, what is it that I'm actually looking at here, okay? Um, and that is why, because, uh, you know, we get caught in the details sometimes, and we can't, we we don't we lose sight of the picture that we're actually yeah, supposed to be yeah. looking at. And what I couldn't... shocked you, Carol, when you started going through um, all of these exotic weapons that you were reading about? What 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 did you find out? What what did you did you discover? I should say. Well, the thing that I discovered that I was actually then able to marry with something I found out later on was that a lot of what's been been tested in our atmosphere are microwave weapons. Yeah, and I think I remember reading. I'm sure I remember reading not too long after those birds died that there was an autopsy. And while there weren't any uh, lacerations or cuts in their skin or anything like that, all of their internal organs had burst and bled, and they had bled to death, essentially. You know, microwaves, uh, those, these beams, these frequencies from microwaves, stimulate your cells, and they can actually make your cells burst. So, I mean, these are the things that I thought I was looking at, that maybe I was looking at a microwave weapon. And frankly, at that point, I was able to say, okay, here's my mom, who actually was in a state of maybe not even being able to remember her own social security number at that point in her life, although she was pretty healthy for her age. Maybe she saw something that when they started rolling this stuff out, as they, in my opinion, clearly did on January 1st, 2011, maybe she was going to recognize something that she saw. And she's a civilian working for the military. My information is, and this is, I can't, I can't you know, show you a book where this is written down, Richie, but having asked around to people that really ought to know, it's not that unusual for civilians to be in harm's way when they have high security clearances. Okay, these are details maybe that need to... Were there others, Karen, when you were doing your investigations, did you come across other civilians who had been working in those areas who had died um, maybe younger than expected or in other circumstances? Just John Wheeler, really. Just Wheeler. Yeah, just Wheeler, because things happened very quickly for me at that point, because like I said, once you open that box, all kinds of things start flying out. And pretty soon I was into uh, not just chemical weapons, or not just atmospheric weapons, but we're looking at chemical weapons, biological weapons, and that leads straight to something called, that we colloquially call chemtrails, which has been given the snappy name of geoengineering. And a nice, clean, neutral, you know, non-emotional title that we've given it now. I haven't given it. But they call it geoengineering. And in fact, we know it as chemtrails. And so that's where I sort of left off from my mom, in a way, and moved on with the story. And I have to say that um, at that point, I, I really did need to wonder. I, I really did wonder what the book was going to need to be. What did I want this book to be? Because I'm not the kind of person who writes things just so I can roll around in my own stuff. Okay, I, for me that's really counterproductive. Okay, you can keep a diary if you want to do stuff like that. Yeah, um, but I had a sense that this book needed to be something because I was coming up against some scary stuff, and I have children. Yeah, and uh, the world was becoming a place I didn't want my children to inherit. And it, a really a place I didn't want my children to inherit. I'm not talking about pollution and cleaning up the medians on the highways and things like that. I'm talking about a world where they're swimming around in a plasma that will kill them. 
before their before their time, years and years and years before their time. Okay, so what did I want this book to be because I knew I was writing it? Well, what I ended up with, since I don't do hand wringing when it comes to storytelling, is um, I was able to not only tell my story and my mother's story, which I think is really important, um, because it's the story of an average person who, who, who can tolerate this information and do something with it as we go forward. And that's really important. Because I think, Richie, about 10% of the population can encounter this story <coughs> or any other story like this in data form. And thank God the data is there, because people have given decades of their life to accumulate that data. But mostly, that's really going to get in outside people's comfort zone in a way that they can't tolerate. And well, I, was gonna, gonna, I was just going to get to that. Yeah. Because um, of course, um, um, I'm not stupid. I can look up and I, and I see stuff that I don't understand. And yeah. In the past, I've spoken to pilots uh, on air, um, and I, I'll bring some of those pilots on, on the shows here, who, who say that you know what you're seeing isn't a contrail. It's something yeah. entirely different. However, you and I both know that many people would say to you, <coughs> because you've written the book, so we talk about you, yeah. you would say, come on. Yeah. You know, why, why would somebody be doing that? You know, right. um, how could they be doing it without people knowing about it and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. So you've got to help me answer that question because I get it all the time <laughs> yeah. from, from yeah. friends of mine. How do you answer that question? How could they be doing that? How um, could they be covertly? Doing it? Covertly. Okay, actually, it's really easy to answer that question. And that is because we live in a world that has been severely compartmentalized from the top to the bottom. Okay, you, we really do live in a world where one person in, in one room could be building something that looks like a mushroom at a company, let's say, any company. And then in the next room, somebody's building something that looks like a vacuum cleaner. But, and they don't know that when they put those two things together, they've got a deadly weapon. Or an do you know what I'm saying? I and do, they yeah, never yeah. know. They never know what they're doing. We talk about the Manhattan Project, don't we? We talk about the Manhattan and how, Project. And how, how secret that was, was kept, despite the fact that mm -hmm. probably, I mean, you'll know better than me, but tens of thousands of people yes. quite possibly worked on it, and yet people didn't know what was happening. People didn't know what was happening, number one. And, and when you say what kind of people, that's, I'm glad you brought that up, because when you say what kind of people would put together a program like that, well, let's talk about the Manhattan Project scientists, OK? Let's talk about the people who were told flat out, if you detonate this thing that you're building in our atmosphere, the chances are very, very, very high that you're going to end life as we know it. And what did they do, Richie? They did it anyway. Twice. We're talking about psychosis here. We're not talking about peop people who operate on the same ethical or rational level that you and I do. Okay, so you have to bear that in mind. There are people like that, and they have their finger on buttons that they shouldn't have their, finger, their fingers on. So the other thing, getting back to the book though, the other thing I was able to do with this was compile all of the information and all of the personalities and, and all of the people who have tirelessly dedicated decades and decades of their life to this issue. And by the way, at great personal risk, because up until a few years ago, it was very dangerous to talk about this stuff, okay? And uh, they're, they're here. Their stories are here. What they have found out is here. And it's here in a format that is um, tolerable. Okay, it's a story. And You've written it in a kind of a faction way. It it's is, a new yeah. wonderful term, faction. Yeah. So it's fiction. Sorry, it's fact, um, but, but but in a, you know put into a kind of a fictitious Indeed. way. So you've changed a lot of names. And, I have. And Indeed. stuff like that. Have you ever found out? Uh, I mean, what was the last about your your mother? What was the last you heard from? Oh, your, the, okay. The there? Well, um, <laughs> the last thing that I uh, discovered about my mother, which uh, was this last May, I believe, I was back in Maine. And uh, a couple of things happened. You have to understand that uh, two things, and I, this does go to answer your question, never fear. Um, but uh, the day I finished writing this book, eight hours after I finished writing this book, coincidentally, my house burned to the ground, OK? Um, and I ran back into the house to get my um, thumb drive out of the computer that had my book on it. OK, you have to know that, because, because in order to answer that question, what's the last thing you heard about your mother, you have yeah. to realize that they never really stopped hassling me. If you want to call burning my house down hassling. Now, the burning of the house, was it investigated? No, because it looked electrical, and that's fine. We let, they so, left so, it. So the official verdict was, official verdict was, was electrical, was electrical uh, you know, yeah. and But you, know, you suspect something when else. You're, well, isn't that a coincidence, Richie? I mean, that it would burn down the day I finished writing the book? I mean, I have to call it a coincidence because I don't have a smoking gun, but gosh, yeah. this is quite but the you're, trail but you're bound of to coincidences. Wonder, yeah. Of course, yeah. yes, yes, you're bound yeah. to wonder. So, uh, okay, having said that and, and establishing the fact that they never really have stopped messing with me, 
uh, in May, I went home to see my children, and uh, I had had my passport stolen in Spain, strangely enough. So I'd gotten a new passport from my consulate there, gone home, turned everything into the State Department immediately to get a new passport. So there I was, sitting in Maine with no credentials, no papers, as they say, just going about my business. And I was on Skype talking to my husband, who was back here in London one morning, and someone appeared on my Skype pretending to be, and I'm going to say that because I'm sure that's what that was, one of the highest ranking military officials in the United States. Asking so you get a Skype from somebody saying, I'm Hi, Kara, such and can such. I be your yeah, friend? Yeah. yeah, and I'm looking at it thinking, huh. Can't be him. Huh, yeah, can't be him. Exactly. But I was very curious, and uh, so I, I answered him and I said, So, okay, general, I can say general. Uh, why me? I don't know you from Adam. And uh, he said, What are you scared of a little general, Kara? I mean, these are the kinds of things. I, walking on the beach, I've been circled by helicopters, things like that. Okay? So you think it's just people letting you know that? Hey, look, we're. They're just trying we're, to we're shake me. An eye on what you're and saying here, let me tell you that, that that's that's like a one-two punch, Richie. You'll see this in a second. It freaked me out to begin with. Okay, and I uh, blocked him, and uh, talked to my husband about it, who was also just ever so slightly freaked out. And then two days later, I get a call from the uh, attorney, not the attorney general, but the um, I don't know, the prosecutor's office. I was handling my mother's case. The fellow who had been charged with manslaughter and had pled guilty to manslaughter and had spent quite some time trying to avoid having to go to prison over manslaughter, had um, the sixth time he was supposed to be in court had a stroke. Okay. Now, did you look into his background, this guy? I Who was this guy? Yeah, I really couldn't look. He didn't I mean, have any military connections have any, or anything like that, right? I'm not, I'm not sure that he, whether he did that's or the first, it's the yeah, first thing you have, think, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, who is this guy? Who is he being at? Mm -hmm. I didn't yeah. have, I couldn't find any information on this fellow. He'd been in a nursing home with this quote-unquote stroke, I'm going to say it that way, for a couple of years. The prosecutor refused to drop the charges because it's not unknown that people play possum like that. I mean, she said he could be fine in a week, suddenly and miraculously, and we'll just finish this up and we'll, he'll serve his time or whatever. But two days after this, <clears throat> this imaginary general contacted me on Skype, I get a call saying that this fellow's attorney has decided, has argued very, very vociferously that he's too ill to see the inside of a prison. And so, despite my prosecutor's attempts to block this, they just dismissed the charges. So he, he walked. I don't think he can walk, Richie, but. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. No, but you yes. know what I mean, yeah. Yeah, metaphorically yeah. So, speaking. Yeah. And, and here's the thing about yeah. that, Richie. Because I was already rattled, this is something they do all the time. I was already rattled about something, so something else came along that I might have raised, you know what about, and I wasn't quite so ready to raise you know what about it, because I was already rattled by this other thing. So this is how they operate. They keep you shaken up to a certain extent, yeah? So that you don't, and this is part and parcel of, of, of how they operate. So this is the last thing that I heard about my mother is that, yes, that the man who uh, ran her down is uh, had the charges dropped because he's too ill to see the inside of a prison, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Because, I mean, the only thing that really does make sense is like, okay, time served in a nursing home, then done. But um, anyway, so that's um, what's extraordinary is you had no interest really no. In, before any of this in exotic weapons, weather no. modification, no. geoengineering, any of that sort of stuff at all. It was no. it was through all of this that you started getting into it. And you mm -hmm. remain convinced that there are, uh, I mean, um, I'll be talking to David about the papers in, in a couple of minutes mm -hmm. time. And David often makes the point that why would you have international agreements not to modify the weather unless you could do it? That's right. And I don't really have any answer for that. You know, I think, right. well, I suppose, yeah, you wouldn't, right. you wouldn't do that. Well, you what know? you'll find and uh, what you'll find is there are treaty after treaty after treaty that forbids us from doing anything like this. And in fact, all you really have to do is go back to the Nuremberg Treaty. Yeah, that should cover the whole thing consent of each individual to be tested with chemicals, okay? And you will note, because I've known, uh, this is important, our, our President Obama, when he was uh, speaking in relation to Syria, yeah, expressly said it is not okay to use chemicals of any kind on your own people or anybody else's people, even in a time of war. And I had to say at the time, I absolutely agree with you. And yet, we're all being dou doused in chemicals, all right? I'm not sure, there's some, there's some overwhelming evidence, isn't there, mm -hmm. in Hawaii, yeah. Um, yeah. levels of certain um, metals like, um, what are they called again? I'm, All right, um, they are strontium, called barium, strontium, barium, stuff, aluminum. Yeah. These are micron sized, sub micron sized particles, put the, putting them in the nanoparticle range, which means they can get into our lungs far more easily than, say, asbestos. 
Um, one of the things they're dropping on us is barium. But wouldn't they be doing it to themselves? They are. I always ask this question. They are indeed. Okay. And uh, the only thing I can say about things like that are, well, there are a couple things I can say about that. First of all, we're, talk we're dealing with psychosis, number one. We're dealing with a population that has been socially engineered. That is really important, and that is something that's in here as well. How do the people let themselves get to this point, okay, when they're really sort of almost being herded into an abattoir in a way, yeah? The 20s, take a snapshot of the 20th century, and what you have is a, is a snapshot of social engineering, yeah? Started, well, we can pull up the name of Edward Bernays, nephew of Sigmund Freud, the Tavistock Institute. All of that led to Madison Avenue. The 20th century was a, was a giant experiment in trying to figure out how to get the human to, do, to move in the direction that you want him or her to move. And they did a really good job with that. And one of the things that, uh, that I was able to deal with in this book is to examine how my mother got to be somebody who would, uh, as an intelligent, normal, compassionate person, be in a position like that. How, what about the pilots? What about the people who are actually dropping this stuff on us? Okay, well, I have a pilot in here. I have several. We examine the psychology of that. Um, and what are the reasons that they might do that? If they're convinced that they're saving the world, okay, then, then maybe it's worth it to them to poison themselves to save the world. And, and this is the psychology that, especially since World War II in the United States, you have a population that's been convinced that the only thing at that point, whether it's ridiculous or not, we were convinced that we were standing between the end of the world. You know, the only thing that was standing between the end of the world uh, was the American military, yeah? I mean, the newsreels, my mom was nine years old going to watch the newsreels. You know, come, these people come from broken homes, they're looking for, and this is really important to talk about, they are looking for people to parent them in a way. And the military does a really good job of providing that kind of authoritarian uh, impulse to people who have lost their... they fill their, the vacuum. They fill the vacuum, and, yeah. they, and, and they've done a really good job of taking it away the things that make that hold us as humans in that way, and the family, getting the moms out of the home. Um, and, and the other place where we get that in the United States, and boy, do we get that in spades, is in the schools, okay? Those schools, especially in my country, where uh, we have a very short history, Richie. It's 200 years old, or plus or minus, yeah? Plus or minus, it's plus. It's plus, It's yeah. plus, it's I plus, know that. Yeah. Um, but I go through, in a public school, you would call it a state school here, you go from first grade to the end, 12th grade hearing the same 200 years in their version, by the way, over and over and over and over. And you know what? That's not education. That's brainwashing. Okay? And so uh, because uh, the schools are taking more and more and more power away from the parents, all right, it's a principle you've called... This, you've seen it in yeah. this country this week, only yesterday we yeah. got into it. Yeah. It's called in loco parentis. That is the principle that's being enacted there. So all of these almost anonymous, faceless organizations, power structures, are parenting people. And um, that's how you get citizens, uh, human beings who might be willing to do this to each other, yeah? Because the social engineering aspect of the 20th century is every bit as important as the geoengineering aspect of the 20th century. And those two things together are what's causing um, situations like this. We've got to leave it there, I'm afraid we're oh. just about out of time. I'm going to give a, a plug to the book. Um, this is the book, it's The Sun Thief. Um, this is the German version. The German version, enough, You've yeah. only got the German version with you. Cara St. Louis, it was a pleasure. Thanks for coming on Thanks, the show. Richie. Thanks, Richie. Really enjoyed it. We will take a very quick break now, and when we come back, David Icke will join me to talk about the main headlines today. You're with The People's Voice. Don't go anywhere. Back in a minute.